friend in Southern California whose name is Tom. I met Tom back in the early 1970s and have enjoyed a relationship with him since then. Even though we've been back here for 20 years, I still hear from Tom every uh, Christmas season with a large envelope, and I always know what's in it. Let me tell you about Tom. Tom's hobby is restoring old vehicles. It turns off all the women here, but some of the guys here are <laughs> thinking, boy, that, what a great thing. When I first met him, the engine was out of the uh, 1957 Bonneville Pontiac, came out that year with a, uh, with a, a brand new uh, uh, style called the Bonneville, and uh, it only came out in a convertible. 310 horsepower engine, which was on the floor of the other part of the garage, and his head was down in the, in the frame area doing something with the chassis. He had just redone the whole uh, uh, wheel assembly on each uh, part of the vehicle, and, and it was uh, beauty in the making, but at the time, it was one ugly beast. <laughs> I'll never forget when Tom, and I'd known him at that time about oh, probably two or three months, said, let me show you the trunk. So he manipulated the way because it had been rusted closed, and he finally got it open. He said, you could lay seven bodies across here and <laughs> still have room for the weapons. And I thought, do I want to be a friend with a guy like that? <laughs> and I did want to be a friend to Tom. Every year he sends me, uh, you guys will get a kick out of this. Abandon Auto's calendar every year, every year. On the front of this one appears in the November part of the calendar, and it's an old 1957 uh, Thunderbird. Uh, back in the days when it uh, had the little porthole in the rear. Uh, some of the ladies know about that. I'm proud of you. That's terrific. But, you know, you'd never know it as you look at this because uh, this is the result of what Tom would call neglect, neglect. He used to kind of uh, train me as we would go, go through the calendar together and we'd look at one car after another, a Nash, a Hudson, an, an old uh, Chevy, a Plymouth, remember those days? And No, you don't. And a <laughs> Studebaker and on and on. Here's an old Chrysler 46 sedan right after the war. They made them again. Uh, and Tom would say, you know, the cars just haven't been loved. Most of them have been abandoned, which is what the name of the calendar is. And it hanging on a rusty nail in my garage every, every January. And remember Tom every time I look at it. He said, uh, all, all it is is neglect because he said, in, a car is made to drive. First of all, he said, you're supposed to love it. I've never gotten to where I love a car, but I do drive a car. And he said, you need to really uh, put a little speed on it at times because it's made for that, especially if the engine's large and it's the kind that can, uh, can be driven with uh, uh, excessive speed. He said, it's really fun. So when he finished the, the Bonneville, <laughs> Yeah, I kind of slipped that in, didn't I? He, <laughs> when he finished the Bonneville, he came over from the house and honked the horn. I walked out, and, I mean, it's enough to bring tears to your eyes. And I said, oh, man, that, that thing is gorgeous. He said, hop in. So we took a drive and all the way there to the greasy spoon where we always had a bowl of chili together. Uh, he would talk about what went into the... the uh, the rebuilding of the car, and it was by now a, really a thing of beauty, known as a classic car. There's a place named Hemmings up in Vermont where these classic cars have all been restored, and you can go and see one after another. Uh, many of the brands no longer made. Many of the models have long since been forgotten but they are like they just came off the showroom floor because someone 
has uh, stopped neglecting them and started loving them and has uh, found the time and uh, gone to the expense of uh, rebuilding them, putting them back in the condition. And of course, the goal is to use everything you can in the rebuilding that's original. Many of the car places and many of, the, of these uh, shops carry original parts. And uh, I had a Model A for a long time and had rebuilt it. And it was, uh, it was a real beauty. And, and all of those parts that we put in it uh, came from uh, original parts that were kept at the shop. People don't know that, but Ford has done that for years, all the way back to 1927, 28. When I got the calendar yesterday and began to look at this, I, uh, I, I realized that uh, we are just the opposite. We are just the opposite. Uh, we are not made for racing. We're not made for speed. We neglect uh, the most important thing in our life when we add noise and speed to our world. If we don't have that with cars, they sit in the woods and finally just decay. In fact, one of the pictures is, is a incredible. There's a tree growing up out of the hood. The hood's been pushed back. It's in a woods up in uh, New Hampshire, as I recall, and this tree is now, the trunk is maybe uh, 15, 18 inches wide as the car is set there while the tree has grown up in it. When you neglect a car, you ruin it. When you race a life, you ruin it. When you have noise and activity and constant, constant movement, you begin to neglect what your life is all about. It's healthy for a car to go through that, but it's unhealthy for a person to go through that. Gordon MacDonald writes in his book, Ordering Your Private World, few of us can fully appreciate the terrible conspiracy of noise there is about us. Noise that denies us the silence and solitude we need for the cultivation of our inner person. Listen closely. It would not be hard to believe that the arch enemy of God has conspired to surround us at every conceivable point in our lives with the interfering noises of civilization that when left unmuffled, interesting uses the term of an auto part, a muffler, when left unmuffled, usually drown out the voice of God. He who walks with God will tell you plainly, God does not shout to make himself heard. I think it was C.S. Lewis who spoke of God's megaphone when he speaks to us in our times of silence. I'm talking to you this semester again and again about the importance of becoming intimate with your Lord. I, I spoke earlier about intimacy itself and then the next time about simplicity. Today I want to talk about the value of silence and solitude. I don't mock you when I do that. I know you're in school. And I know that you are praying for the Lord's return before next week. <laughs> I know that. I, I, I understand that. I did that year after year, year after year, and he did not return. So I, I'm with you. I'm, I'm, hoping he, I'm hoping he does. 
But if he doesn't, and years ago, we used to have our finals after Christmas. And that was fun. <laughs> All the time we were trying to celebrate Christmas, we're thinking about that exam. And this, uh, oh, but now we've gotten a little smarter around here. We've decided to push them up and let it come before Christmas. I, I know what you're facing. I understand pressure. I, I live with pressure. Pressure like I never knew at the seminary, and I didn't think it would ever get stronger than it is here. And it is strong here. It's stronger out there. The noise is louder out there. All kinds of things will crowd into your life, brothers and sisters. And uh, they will beg for your attention. Cynthia and I were having a brief meal the other evening at a little hamburger spot and across from us was a man who sat with his family and he had a phone at his ear the entire meal. Rather than visiting with his family, he's talking on the phone and they're eating their meal, looking down as if, as Cynthia put it, they're used to it. Something wrong when we have become so comfortable with a phone in our ear that we can ignore the very priceless few moments with those who bear our name and have our blood. You can get like that. You can form habits right here that can steal the precious moments of quietness and rest and release from all that. And today I come to plead with you. Once the finals are over and a little bit of reprieve is allowed, be still, be quiet, slow down. As we often would say to one another when we were in too big a hurry, just cool your jets, calm down. Because if you don't, you'll be all involved in planning on the next semester or an extra few hours of work or engaged in some other electronic device that you've saved for and will buy and begin to serve instead of the other way around. In your Bibles, you will find in Psalm number 46 an imperative that is easy to miss. It is a hyphial imperative of Rapha, which means cease. There's a sign we have here on our streets, just one word means exactly what it says. I came upon several of them driving to the seminary today. Stop. Stop. Don't pull up and then rush on. Stop. And this particular command in verse 10 of Psalm 46 comes after a number of things that could really, really get to you. He begins with the most important word in all our lives, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in time of trouble. Ein Festeberg ist unser Gott. A towering strength is our God. Luther wrote of it in the hymn, a mighty fortress, as it's been translated into English, drawn from the 46th Psalm. Because God is a towering strength, not a help, but a very present help, an immediate help, a help for now, right now, today, 9th of December, 2014, right now, at 1106, a very present help. Tomorrow, just when you need him, a very present help. Middle of the night, when you need him, a very present help. 
our God is right there. Don't become so familiar with him that you forget that. You will learn all about him more than you ever knew in your life as you study here, and that's as it should be. But don't let the familiarity breed an indifference. Guard against that. You get like that when your studies stack up and when your pace increases and when your engine runs and rarely idles. Stop. And realize that he's God. Look at the situations. In light of what the first verse promises us, a very present help. Therefore, watch closely. We will not fear, though we go through natural disasters. The earth should change. Mountains slip into the heart of the sea. Most of you have never experienced an earthquake. You haven't lived till you've gone through a six point or greater. It is the most insecure feeling on this planet, I think. When the foundation around you, around you or the earth beneath you, beneath you begins to roll and shift. We had an old uh, grandfather clock in our home in California, which, uh, faithfully kept time, faithfully chimed, and it would let us know when an earthquake was coming. That and our dog, who had a way of howling, knowing it was coming. And the earth would begin to roll a little, and, the, and then there would be chimes that wouldn't, weren't supposed to be sounding, and then there would be like, gong, 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 gong. We had a chandelier in our dining room and and the the, the greater the uh, uh, strength of that earthquake the, the more that chandelier would swing we had a swimming pool in the yard behind us and we were up at a on our second floor bedroom we could look down the on the on that swimming pool it looked like a bunch of kids playing in the bathtub water pouring out each end as the earth is shifting and changing, and you think, is this the big one? We're going to wind up in the Pacific? <laughs> right along the fault line, you who have lived there, you know that. You felt it. I've seen sections of buildings crumble. I've seen tall chimneys shake. Bricks begin to fall off and tumble it down uh, to the earth. It's the most insecure feeling. We will not fear, though the earth should change and the mountains slip to the heart of the sea. We will not fear, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains quake at its swelling pride. God is in the midst of her, verse 6, verse 5. She will not be moved. We will not be moved. Why? Because God is our refuge, because God is our strength. He isn't the subject of the course we're taking. He is our personal rescue, our refuge, our hope, our reason to disengage from fear, which is the most natural response to something like this. You immediately feel fear, immediately, even though you think you're ready for it, you're not. Even in a car, when there's an earthquake, you can feel the car rolling and, and moving in ways that, that aren't a normal feeling of being in the vehicle. And, and you're going through it knowing the epicenter may not be that far away. He goes on, God will help her when morning dawns. And now he moves to... Uh, from a natural disaster to an international disturbance. Look at this. Nations made an uproar. The kingdoms tottered, verse 6. He raised his voice. The earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold, Selah. Earlier, Selah, end of verse 3. I have a friend who every time he reads Selah, he translates it 
pause and let that sink in. Probably a musical notation. Pause right there. Sometimes a pause is as eloquent as anything in a piece of music or a message that you're hearing. Those who know how to pace their pauses, composers who know how to place their pauses, capture the attention of the audience. We were listening to our choir sing last Sunday morning. It was a brand new piece. And our uh, minister of music had them pause and then go on. I, it, it was the most effective part of the song. You went, you wanted to suck in your breath. No one moved. Then you go on. When you get to Sila, don't just race on to the next verse. Pause right there. It's placed there for a reason. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Come, behold the works of the Lord who has wrought desolations in the earth. He makes wars to cease. To the end of the earth, he breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two, burns the chariots with fire. Stop. See it? My Bible reads, cease striving. The Living Bible, stand silent. The Amplified, be still and know, recognize, understand, I am God. Moffat, give in. He cries, admit that I am God. Another, stop fighting. Know that I am God. I've always enjoyed Eugene Peterson's message. Step out of the traffic. Take a long, loving look at me, your high God, above politics, above everything. It's an emphatic imperative. With a causative stem, you're engaged in the stopping. No one else can stop the striving for you. You're, you're, some of you are already striving over that exam next week. You're going to study. You're going to prepare. You're going to do the very best you can do. That's all you can do. Stop striving. I studied with two brilliant, brilliant men when I was a student here. They would come over to our home. Neither was married at the time. Ralph Alexander, who went on to get his doctorate and to teach up in Portland, and, and Bill Bell, some of you know from Dallas Baptist College, went on to get his PhD, New York University, brilliant, brilliant men. And we would finish the setting. I, I, I always listened to them. I always learned so much from being around one, a graduate of Rice, Ralph and the other, a graduate of Georgia Tech with his master's already in Louisiana State University. Bright, bright minds. And I learned to study from them, and I learned to stop striving from them. We'd close our books. We'd pray together. It would be close to midnight, a full day tomorrow in, in exams, and they would say, okay, we've done our best. We'll do our best tomorrow. Let's relax. It's the psalmist way of saying stop striving and know, know that I'm God. He's just described natural disasters, international distress, even personal distress. Our older daughter uh, struggled with a wandering eye, weak, weak muscles in her in, in uh, one of her eyes. She was growing up. My heart just went out to her. To correct the problem, we did our best to do it with lenses and ultimately realized we're going to have to go through a pediatric ophthalmolic, uh, ophthalmological surgery. I hope there's such a word. <laughs> we went to the best we could find uh, here. And uh, he said, you know, the, mu the muscles of the eye are held, uh, are the eyes held by the muscles on each side, and I'll do my best. It's a bit of a guesswork, 
And he said, uh, I, I can't guarantee. And uh, when he finished his work uh, and she had recovered his, uh, enough to know where it would be, her eye had now moved outward. Very embarrassing for a little girl. And the lenses got thicker and we said, well, when we moved, once we moved to California, we found another physician and, and he's now, that was just an ophthalmologist. I'm, now we go to a pediatric ophthalmologist, which means their, their bill is higher and their, their specific specialty is, is more uh, focused. And uh, he had a long talk with us. He said, I know you've been through it before. You need to know now there's scar tissue. And Carissa's eye may or may not be straight. And I thought, boy, as much as we're paying you, you better get it straight, buddy. <laughs> and he says, I'll do my very best. So she went into surgery again with tears. She woke up and there was a rim of blood across her eyelid when she woke up. Her eye was swollen and uh, I'm, I'm right there uh, to check things out. You know how dads are. Okay, honey, open your eye. Let, let daddy look at you. <laughs> Cynthia would say, Cynthia say, back off. Get back off. Give her a break. I mean, no, I just want to see if her eyes straight. <laughs> you relax. <laughs> I said, honey, honey, op open your eye for daddy. Open your eyes for daddy. And she opened it. And, and the doctor told us, you know, it may not be exactly where you want it, but it could straighten out. I said, no, as hard as we prayed and as expensive as the surgery has been, I, I, it's going to be straight. She opened her eye and her eye looked directly at her nose, completely crossed. I couldn't believe it. This precious little girl already struggling with friends at school that made fun of her and now she's got this eye that's crossed. And Cynthia said, you know what he said to me? I know what he said. It's supposed to be straight and Carissa begins to cry and I, I bolt. I'm thinking, I'm out of here. So a buddy of mine uh, found out that I was uh, really low. His name is Earl. And uh, so I'm, I'm at the study. I put little signs up on the door. Do not disturb. Do not. I wanted to put in prayer, but that wouldn't be true. We just want <laughs> Don't disturb. And he didn't even knock. He just walked right in. He says, come on, let's, let's take it. I said, no, I'm not, I'm not going anywhere with you. No, he says, come on. He had already made arrangements for something I didn't know anything about. So I reluctantly got in his car, and we went down, and... Uh, Got a sandwich and said out in the park, and I'm fighting tears and anger and disillusionment, and Earl's listening to me. And he had uh, talked to Bob Elias. Uh, I'm sorry, Noah. Bob's his daddy. Noah Elias. Noah's a wonderful artist. He was an artist for Disney for years. Now he's on his own. And Noah came by the my study at the church, and uh, he brought with him a, a, a big poster and he drew the picture of an old monk with a with, with a robe on big toe sticking out of the sandals and then he wrote in his own calligraphy did we in our own strength confide our striving would be losing we're not the right man on our side a man of God's own choosing just ask who this may be, Christ Jesus, it is he. Lord Sabaoth his name from age to age the same, and he must win the battle. Man, I got back to my study, and I thought, good night, everybody just coming in. And then I looked, and I saw Bob's, I saw uh, Noah's work propped right up on my desk, signed, I love you, Chuck, Noah. And then drawn through Noah, God. I wish I could say that at that moment the striving ceased, but those words rebuked me. I made a visit to the hospital a day or two later, and the eye had begun to move back. <laughs> it's the greatest story. And finally, straight as an arrow. Doesn't even wear glasses. And um, it was, surgery was 
successful in God's grace. It was abundant. I'm so grateful I have a wife who didn't, didn't say I told you so. <laughs> or a daughter that even remembered my intensity standing right over her face. And a faithful God who forgives me for my panic. Believe me, I understand panic. This says don't panic. Don't let that seize you. Don't let that grip you. Stop and know that I'm God. I will be exalted. 11, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Pause and let it sink in. <clears throat> if you keep your engine roaring, and especially if you do it at mock speed, and if you add hours to your semester, and if you uh, add uh, an, another series of hours to your work, and if you form the habit of going at that kind of pace, you are in for a dreadful, sudden lesson to be learned. There are consequences that follow. Just like these cars that are abandoned and left because they are overlooked and not running, we can run, run at such a pace that we fail to learn by stopping. God does great work. Couple of examples. Exodus chapter 14. Turn there. You who know your Bibles know that uh, we've come to that scene where the Hebrews are finally out of Egypt, they become no longer bricklayers but nomads and they're following the leader and Moses has told them, God's going to take us to the promised land. Canaan is ahead of us. So they go and you know the story it isn't long before they come to the, the sea in front of them, the mountains above them. The Egyptians on horseback racing toward them to bring them back into bondage. And the people see that and they realize the impossible cul-de-sac in which they find themselves. And verse, please observe their response. Uh, verse uh, 10 ends, they became very frightened, so the sons of Israel cried out to the Lord. It's not a crying out of trust, it's a crying out of complaint. And then they take on the leader. You'll learn that's true when people find that what you had preached is not working for them, they'll blame you because it isn't working. Many of them will turn against you because they distrust what you have said. It's not working for them. And so now notice, first of all, the sarcasm. Verse 11, Exodus 14, 11. Then they said to Moses, Is it because there were no graves in Egypt you've taken us away to die in the wilderness? Sarcasm. You mean there weren't enough graves back there when we all had at least a shack to live in? Now we are in the middle of nowhere. There's, but there's also exaggeration to die. Who told them they were going to die? They're not going to die. But when you're panicked, you go to the worst possible scenario. And then they blame him. Why have you dealt with us in this way, bringing us out of Egypt? What's wrong with you? What kind of a leader are you? 
Then there's stubbornness. Is this not the word that we spoke to you in Egypt saying, leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. We'd rather be serving Egyptians than be on our own out there in the middle of nowhere with no shelter over our head and no food for us to eat and no water to drink. Leave us alone. And then there's cynical regret. Look at it. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. Moses' response. So impressed with Moses. I identify with him. He's 80 years old. He's been around the block. He's been kicked around. He knows what it's like. He's gone through all of the disillusionment you can go through. He's had experience after experience. And he says to them, look at it. Moses said to the people, do not fear. That's that treacherous enemy fear. Stand by. Military, you'd say, stand down. Psalmist would say, stop. Stop it. And look at what else he says. See the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you've seen today, you will see them again, never see them again forever. The Lord will fight for you while you keep silent. Be quiet. Stand still. Be quiet. Stop. Quit talking. Turn off the phone. Disengage. Connect. Oh, Lord. Oh, God. I'm facing what seems to me to be a complete impossibility. We don't know how we're going to get, get through this alive. The Egyptians are coming even closer, and the sea is in front of them. And Moses says, stand down and be quiet. Very thing the psalmist said. And you know the result. It's so familiar to us, we've lost the, the impact. I've never seen a sea open and close like this. I, I've never experienced that. Moses hadn't either. But he knew his God. He'll fight for us. He has a way. And the Lord said for you, as for you, lift up your staff, stretch out your hand, step out. Sea open. They went through. Sea closed on the enemy. Only God. I could tell your I could tell you stories today that would make your mouth fall up, fly open. Of ways in which God worked when it was absolutely impossible. I've seen him do things that I could I would never have even dreamed he could have done or would have done. So I'm telling you today from experience, not only from the biblical text, but from experience. It's true. It's true. I learned about God when I was at the school, as you are, and I learned the trustworthiness of this God I discovered and learned about as I stepped out and watched him work. One last little glimpse at something like this. First Kings 19. Turn there next. First Kings 19. Elijah, fresh off of Carmel, marvelous victory. Jezebel gets word of it, sends a messenger, verse 2. May the gods do to me and even more if I do not make your life as the life of one of them, meaning one of the now dead prophets of Baal, but tomorrow, about this time. You got 24 hours, buddy. You're going you're gonna to meet your maker. Look at it again, verse 3. He was afraid. He was afraid. This is Elijah. But a man of like passions as we are, same nature, so don't pedestalize him. 
Here's Elijah. And he rose and ran for his life. Came to Beersheba, left the servants there, and then he went all alone. Most of us, when we're depressed, prefer to be all alone. Often that's the worst place to be because your mind plays tricks on you, and that's where thoughts of suicide come in. That's where dangerous things are planned when there isn't anyone there to temper such thoughts and to bring back reason. So he's all alone. Suicide doesn't come to his mind, but he does ask the Lord to take his life. And uh, he sat down under a juniper tree. Verse 4, he requested that he might die. It's enough, Lord. Take my life. Am I not better than my father's? He lay down and slept and probably was surprised to wake up. So he woke up and he went even further. Finally, when he lodged in a cave, verse 9 I love this. The Lord came to him and said, what, do you, what are you doing here, Elijah? What, what, what are you doing here? He said, I've been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. Verse 10, the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they now seek my life to take it away. I'm one of the few messengers you've got. I'm the only one in this area. Now they're going to kill me. I've been very zealous for you, and now this is the thanks I get. So he's depressed. When you're depressed, you say things like that, a bit of impudence when you talk to the Lord. So he said, go forth and stand the mountain before the Lord. And the Lord was not in the falling of the rocks or the wind or earthquake, not in the earthquake. But the Lord was in a sound of a gentle blowing, verse 12 concludes. I race over it because I know you're familiar with it. I love that sight, that thought. Charles Ryrie in his footnote says, a sound of a gentle blowing. <sighs> Isn't it great the Lord doesn't rebuke him? Well, what kind of a prophet are you? You ought to be ashamed of yourself. God never, ever, ever does that. He never shames his own. We shame each other. We shame ourselves. But the Lord says to him, I need to rest. So he caters a meal, gives him time to rest, relieves him. Gives him a fresh look and later gives him a companion named Elisha who would journey with him not only through the rest of his days but even to the moment of his departure. Companion. I sure hope you have a, uh, a friend cultivating friendships here. Some of my friendships, Cynthia's and mine, go right back to Dallas Seminary. We met him in 59, they're still friends. We knew him better by 62, 63, still friends. I look in the faces of some of the faculty members, I see classmates, still friends. You can't do it alone. I know you're gifted, and I know you're capable, and I know you'll be very well educated. I know you're, I, I know you're gifted. And I know God has for you a plan that will even surprise you with his blessing, but you, you, you need to be close to others. You need to link up with them. You need to be in touch with them. Like Tom. And two dozen others I could name from a place where I haven't been for 20 years. I close with one of the secrets I have discovered for handling times when I would otherwise be fearful. It's a journal. I've never shared the thoughts in my journal, but someday my children will read these journals. I have a number of these volumes in my library. They're all handwritten. They look just like that. They're just my words written to the Lord and about the Lord. It's not a diary. It's a journal. The Lord's doing... <laughs> I ran out of black ink there, didn't I? Whatever. 
They just, they'll learn about their daddy, these children will. They're now in their 50s and 40s. They'll learn things they never knew about my fears, my struggles, the victories God gave, the heartbreaking moments. This journal was written to begin with my first year as president of Dallas Seminary, July 1, 1994. Here's the inauguration. Friday, July 1 of 1994, and ends right near this date 20 years ago and uh, what I was going through at the time. Why do I mention this? Because thoughts disentangle themselves over the lips and through the fingertips. You have very important thoughts, things you've learned that are going to escape you if you don't record them. So over the Christmas holidays, get a book, doesn't matter. Happens to be leather bound because it was given to me. But you can get a spiral book. You can get a big thick one, you get a little one, different size, doesn't matter. Just be sure you write it and don't share it with anybody. My wife's never read my journal. It's not something I write for someone else. It's not something that's going to be published. It's not, I mean, I've had publishers say, you write journals? I go, yeah. They say, hey. I go, no. <laughs> not interested. Pub publishers are like vultures. <laughs> you have words that haven't gone into print? Oh, think of the people that would love to read. I said, yeah, you ought to read some of this stuff. <laughs> Get a journal. Start writing in it. You'll record the things that God is teaching you, and you'll read back over it, and it'll bring you to tears sometime. Others will make you laugh out loud. Some of the things you read will say, well, I remember that. I panicked at that moment. And then eight pages, nine pages later, the answer is recorded where God came through. It's marvelous. Your journal, your story. But you won't do it if you don't be still and get quiet. Be still. Be quiet. Learn that he's God. Thanks, Father, for your patience with us over the years. Thank you for bringing us to this day immature, struggling, stammering though we are. Thank you for understanding us, for your grace blessing us, for your comfort when we didn't know how you were going to solve a situation. Thank you for your faithfulness, for your goodness, your power. And we pause to let the wonder in at this season of the year. Help us to be still.